Okay, good morning everyone. Uh, and uh, let us uh, carry on obviously where we left off yesterday. Uh, so just a quick reminder, we have been looking at this uh, sutta called the Arya Pariyasana Sutta, which means the Noble Search. And it is basically an autobiographical sutta uh, from the Buddha, uh, talking about what he did before his awakening, how he actually um, how he reached the goal. Uh, yeah, so for this reason it's obviously very interesting and very inspiring in so many ways. Uh, and uh, we had just been looking at the idea of the Noble Search. And uh, it is here defined, what is the Noble Search? It is defined as uh, when someone who is themselves liable to be reborn, uh, understanding the drawbacks of being liable to be reborn, they seek the freedom from birth, or the unborn, it has here, supreme sanctuary extinguishment. Uh, yeah, we discussed this in quite a bit of detail yesterday. Yeah. And then you have all of these other things that are problematic, yeah, yeah themselves liable to grow old, uh, understanding the drawback in growing old, uh, they seek the freedom from old age, uh, yeah, uh, the supreme sanctuary extinguishment. Uh. So let's just talk a little bit about the idea of old age. Uh, we'll talk about each of these uh, a little bit because they're all quite interesting. And as I mentioned yesterday, many of these things are specifically said elsewhere in the sutta as to be contemplations that everyone should do, uh, old age being one of those things. Uh, so how can you contemplate old age? Uh, well, obviously you can think about it in a general sense that you're getting older, uh, yeah, kind of a, as an idea in a sense. Uh, but very often the uh, really powerful insight, the powerful impact that these things have on you is not just thinking about them, uh, but actually really seeing it. Uh, yeah, and it's like when you kind of look at yourself in the mirror and you see the signs of old age, uh, or your eyesight is going funny because you're getting, you know, into your forties or whatever. Uh, uh, you know, some people start to you need glasses and all of these kind of things. Uh, and it's when you look at yourself in the mirror and you see the lines in the face coming out, you see the hair becoming grey, uh, you see kind of all of these, uh, all of these things uh, starting to appear. And what happens uh, when, that, when you see that? Uh, and for a lot of people, when you see kind of these signs of old age coming, you feel straight away, you feel like repelled by it. Yeah, it's very unpleasant to see this. Uh, and you kind of go into a sense of denial, you don't want to see that. Uh, and you cannot turn away from it. Uh, and then when you turn away from it because it is unpleasant, uh, the next thing you do is to think of solutions uh, to all that, uh, right? And of course you think about the wrong kind of solution. It's always the wrong kind of solution. The wrong kind of solution is how to extend that denial as much as possible. That is kind of the solution that we are looking for, uh, right? Uh, and so you look for solutions like, okay, maybe I can do some sort of makeup, uh, maybe I can do some sort of hair coloring, right? Uh, that's kind of a kind of traditional way of kind of making sure that you kind of look young. Uh, I can use these days, you get all kind of things that never existed before, like Botox, yeah, become very popular. Uh, I'm not going to ask if anyone here has used Botox because I, <laughs> that's kind of asking a bit too much, I think. Uh, but uh, it seems like everyone these days are becoming more and more common, uh, yeah, these sort of things. Uh, it starts out in Hollywood and it spreads out to the rest of the US, then it goes across the Atlantic, yeah, and it goes, spreads around the whole world. Before you know it, everyone is using this kind of stuff. Uh, so the first step is then denial about what is going on. Uh, the next step is somehow trying to cover it up. Uh, and uh, that uh, idea of covering things up uh, or pretending that it isn't real, yeah, it gives you a sense of agency. It gives you a feeling that you are in control, that, that you can control nature. Yeah? Yeah, that actually this is something that you can, uh, uh, somehow you can deal with this uh, by kind of being smart. You can outwit old age somehow. Uh, and it gives you a feeling of control over the world, which actually is completely fake. Yeah? There's a double problem here. The first problem is just the denial of the reality. You don't want to see it. You don't want to have anything to do with old age. The second thing is, well, once it sinks in that actually something is happening, the second thing is then this feeling that you are going to control it and you're going to take charge of the world. There's a double kind of delusion that is going on there. Behind, at the back of your mind, of course you know that these things are inevitable, but it's kind of at the back of your mind, at the forefront of the mind, is controlling this, managing this uh, somehow. Uh, 
So what is the alternative then? Well, the alternative is that when you see those signs of old age, uh, yeah, uh, in the mirror, uh, or wherever it is, uh, when you see that, and you can feel the rejection is going to be there, you don't really want to see these things. Yeah? Even as a monastic, probably, you don't really want to see these things happening. It's just not pleasant. Uh, but then you stay with it. You say, wait a minute. Uh, okay, I'm having this reaction. Uh, but stay with it instead. Uh, what does it actually feel like uh, when you see these signs of old age? Uh, and what it feels like when you do this, if you stay with it, is that after a while the mind becomes accustomed to it. Uh, you become cool and you become accepting of the fact that the body is deteriorating. Uh, it's going downhill uh, and it becomes okay. Uh, and at that moment when that happens, uh, you start to become less interested in the body. Uh, because the whole purpose of interest in the body is precisely because we are hoping or thinking that somehow it will stay young, it will stay you know, and look like we looked like 20 years ago, or whatever. Yeah, this is idea that we actually will, our attractiveness will not decline. And so when you stay with it like that, and you see it, actually, you start to reject the body a little bit because you understand the nature of the body. And that is actually a very beautiful moment because the moment you reject the body a little bit, maybe rejecting is the wrong word, but you are giving up a bit of the attachment, giving it up a bit of the desire for the body because you start to understand its nature here. Yeah? You become peaceful at that point. Yeah? Because attachments and desires are, of course, precisely the things uh, that make you not peaceful, uh, that make you agitated. Yeah? So stay uh, with that feeling of going old. Yeah? Stay with it for a while. Uh, and see if you get to that point when you feel the peace coming into your mind uh, as a consequence of seeing that reality. Yeah? This is the purpose of uh, kind of contemplating these things in the right way. Yeah? And very often the most powerful times is when you actually see it properly, yeah? rather than when you reflect on it in a more superficial way, but actually being face to face, uh, quite literally <laughs> face to face in the mirror and seeing what's going on there. Yeah? And then uh, when you kind of give up your attachment a little bit to the body, you start to feel peaceful. Yeah? The other thing that happens, of course, because you are giving up the hope of fixing the world, fixing things that cannot be fixed, because you're actually accepting nature, it also makes you move on to the spiritual path. Because you understand that the worldly pleasures are problematic, they're inherently unreliable. There's no way you can control this world. Not even your own body can be controlled, let alone the other things in the world. And so it actually moves you in a different direction. It moves you towards the spiritual practice, uh, understanding where, again, the idea, where real contentment can be found, uh, where happiness can be found, uh, and moving away from the suffering of the world. Uh. It's a simple thing, right? It's a really, really simple thing. Uh, but actually, it has profound consequences. Uh, and of course, that is the reason why the Buddha emphasizes these things, uh, right? Precisely because of these uh, consequences. Uh, moves you in the right direction. You're giving up the five senses a little bit, uh, understanding the downside of the body. Uh, this is the foundation for samadhi to work, uh, and that's why this is emphasized. Uh, giving up the body and the five senses uh, will enable, eventually, samadhi to happen. And this is part of that process. Uh. There's a beautiful story in the, in the suttas, uh, and the story of uh, an ancient king called Makka Deva, Makkadeva, I'm not trying to think what that means, Makka, Makka, Makka usually means uh, something like uh, uh, denigration, Deva is the god, the god of denigration, no, it doesn't, the god of denigration doesn't make much sense, I'm not sure exactly what it means, so anyway, Makkadeva, probably maybe just the name, uh, and uh, this is a time when the lifespan of human beings is really, really enormous, it's the 84,000 years or something like that, uh, so you can ask later on, if you wish, how that is possible. How can human beings become 84,000 years old? It's a good question. And if this body became 84,000 years old, it would be a very interesting sight. So I think, yeah, so that, that's, but let's leave that aside for now, how that is possible, whether it's possible, whether it's a myth or what's going on. But uh, he then goes to his barber, yeah, and because the lifespan is 84,000 years old, he says to his barber, well, when you see a gray hair on my head, let me know. Then after 20,000 years, yeah, that's kind of the period of youth and at that time, 20,000 years of youthfulness, uh, yeah, and then kind of you're kind of going into maybe slightly middle age around that time, uh, 
And then the barber says, Sir, I see gray hair on your head. And the king says, Well, pull it out. So he gets a pair of pincers, pull out the gray hair, and shows it to the king. And the king says, Yes, that's the gray hair. That is a divine messenger. Yeah, the gray hair is the divine messenger. It's, it is the message, message that you are getting old. Yeah, things are happening. Youth is finished. Now deterioration is starting. Things are all downhill from here on. Actually, the downhill from the moment you're born. But anyway, this is really starting to go downhill, right, at this particular point. And uh, this is beautiful, right? This is exactly what we're trying to do. When we look at yourself in the mirror, when you see the grayness of the hair, when you see the wrinkles, the, the sagging of everything, uh, and the kind of the weakening of your faculties, all of these things. Uh, this is a divine messenger. It's a reminder of reality. Uh, and it shows you what you should be doing, uh, what actually really matters in life. Uh, this is what this king does. And then this king, because he is a very wise king, uh, he then says, well, this means it's time for me to go forth. Uh, and these are kind of very powerful kings. Uh, uh, who live for 84,000 years, who have vast kingdoms, right? But they also have a degree of uh, wisdom that is uncommon, according... This, these are mythologies, obviously, yeah. but they have that wisdom as well. They give up all of that, uh, yeah, kind of more than any earthly being would have uh, in ordinary times. Give it all up. Uh, they go forth uh, and they start meditating, and they do the Brahma Viharas, and they have the, the spreading metta and compassion to the whole world, they enter the jhana states, these kind of things. Uh, and uh, <coughs> it's a beautiful idea, the most powerful king imaginable, uh, giving up that kingdom, giving up that life, uh, because they see a, one single gray hair on their head. Uh, right? So look out for that one single gray hair, uh, I know the first one when it appears. Uh, so. Um, that's kind of fascinating. So let's so let's take these opportunities, right? When uh, we are given all of these opportunities all the time, uh, and so we should take them uh, and we should try to use them to adva our advantage uh, instead of hiding, instead of pretending that we can manage reality somehow. Reality is there under the surface, whether you try to manage it or not. Uh. So this is like the one way of thinking about the contemplation of old age, uh, right? Uh, and. Uh, I don't know what you think about that, whether you're kind of on board with this or you reject this sort of teachings. Uh, but uh, it is no point in rejecting it, uh, because uh, it is the reality. Uh, and unless we deal with the reality, we're not going to go anywhere. Uh. Okay, so then the Buddha says, uh, it is when someone themselves is liable to fall sick. Yeah? Understanding the drawbacks in falling sick, they seek the freedom from illness, uh, the supreme sanctuary extinguishment. Uh, similar kind of thing as with old age. Uh, when you get sick, what do you do? Uh, first of all, you don't like it. Ah, sickness, this isn't right, I shouldn't be sick. I'm living healthy, I'm eating well, this is kind of something has gone wrong. I went to the wrong place, I didn't wear a mask when I should have worn a mask. <laughs> whatever it is, yeah, that's kind of how we tend to think about things. Uh, and so we get COVID or whatever. And, um, but, uh, of course, the reality is that, uh, again, it is not something that we really can manage. Uh, sickness will always happen to us. Uh, and sometimes we can live the most healthy, the most lifestyle possible, uh, and you still get cancer, you still get heart disease. Uh, certainly you get all the little illnesses that everyone gets. Uh, this is, again, part of life to get these things. Nothing has gone wrong if you get sick. In fact, everything has gone right uh, when you get sick. Uh, you should expect to get sick every now and again. Uh. And then there's that famous story that Adam Brahma always tells. It's a really nice story uh, where you, when you should go to the doctor and you should say to your doctor, 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 something is right with me. I'm sick again today. Uh. And the doctor sends you off to the psychiatrist uh, <laughs> <laughs> to sort you out. <laughs> But it's true, right? Uh, it's true, because actually this is the nature of this body. So when you f feel sick, don't be in denial about it. You can feel that illness. Uh, this is the truth of that illness. Uh, and the next thing we do after kind of saying, oh no, I'm sick, is wrong. The next thing we do is kind of go to the doctor, get some pills, find some kind of medicine so we can overcome it, uh, do anything, right, to kind of overcome the problem. And again, it's this feeling of it being in our power to manage sickness. Uh, we delude ourselves that somehow we can manage these things. Uh, and it is possible to uh, 
you know, to sort of somehow overcome it. It's not a necessity. I'm not saying we shouldn't take medicines. Of course we should take medicines. Uh, it would be crazy not to. Uh, but before you go into the medicine cabinet, uh, stay with that feeling for a while. Okay, I'm sick. Uh, actually, nothing has gone wrong. Uh, this is the nature of the body. Uh, and if this is the nature of the body, the body is far less interesting than I thought it was. Uh, if I have to feel these feelings, I don't know, have you been sick recently? What it feels like to be sick? It feels terrible. I, tend, I usually have good health, at least up to this point. From this moment on, I may get terrible health, just to be clear about the reality. But for the first 50, how old am I now? 58 years of my life, I've been pretty, pretty healthy. Yeah, yeah and, uh, and sometimes I get sick, and it feels just absolutely terrible. It's like you lose your energy, you kind of lie there in bed, you're moaning, and, and <laughs> oh, <laughs> feeling sorry for yourself or whatever it is. Uh, and it's just really, really awful. Uh, and uh, then you realize this is uh, the nature of the body here. Uh, this is what this body is. Uh, there isn't really any way out of this. Uh, old age and sickness. Uh, and again, it makes the body so much more or less interesting. Uh, if this is the nature of this uh, this beast. <laughs> yeah, and uh, I don't know about you, but sometimes when you look at uh, kind of an idea, of the, you look at the body, the physiology of the body, you look at all the kind of parts and bits and pieces, all the blood vessels, all the nerves, and all the, how it all is stuck together. I think it's a miracle it even works for a single second, to be honest. Uh, it is so complicated, this thing. Uh, it's like, it's really, really complicated. Uh, it's kind of... Uh, I so, so every second I can take another breath, every, I'm kind of happy about being able to breathe another breath because this thing surely shouldn't be working so well there. <laughs> I don't know how it feels sometimes. So, so uh, then when you get cancer, uh, okay, you may not be happy to get cancer, but you realize actually uh, this is the nature of things. Uh, yeah, you get, uh, get all of these terrible illnesses that really drain your life from you. These two are part and parcel of it. Uh, Life, you get long COVID or whatever people seem to be having. Yeah. So, um, uh, illness is part of uh, life, uh, turns you away from the body, yeah. makes the body less interesting. That whole world of the body, kind of you release it a little bit, you attach a little bit less, you have less desire for these things. It turns you onto the spiritual path, uh, it makes the mind the significant thing in the world because the mind is free from the body. The mind can be developed independently of the body. You build up the beauty inside. You forget about the beauty outside uh, because basically it is so unreliable and uncertain. Uh. So again, simple uh, but powerful reflections. Uh, yeah? The idea of uh, illness uh, being part and parcel of life. Okay. Uh, then we have uh, death, right? Uh, so when someone who is liable to die, understand the drawbacks in being liable to die. Yeah. <laughs> yes, that's, there are some drawbacks in dying, that's true. Uh, uh, seeks the <laughs> freedom from death, uh, the supreme sanctuary, uh, extinguishment. Uh, yeah, so you uh, reflect on death uh, and you kind of see the... Uh, the reality of death, you understand the problem. Yes, the drawbacks are pretty obvious. We can actually talk a little bit about the drawbacks in a second because uh, they are kind of very useful to reflect on. Uh, but uh, just the understanding that death is an ever-present possibility. Uh, and that is a, a very important point. I did talk a little bit about death before. Uh, but actually it is worthwhile really reflecting on this uh, because we tend to push away the idea of death. We don't really want to hear about it. Uh, and there was a very interesting study that I'd like to mention. I mentioned this before various times. Uh, this was done in South Africa. And this was a study, uh, a psychological study of people. And it, uh, it asked the question, what happens uh, when people read about death in the newspaper? Uh, right? Uh, so you read about death in wherever it might be. Uh, and uh, there's always accidents, always problems happening around the world. Uh, always someone dying. Uh, People die at all kinds of ages. Uh, and so they looked at the reaction of people when they read about someone else dying in the paper. Uh, and the reaction was always, uh, oh yeah, whatever, someone has died, yeah, it's nothing to do with me, it's you know, someone else, uh, they probably made a mistake, you know, they should have uh, done something different. And then they kind of turned the page and carry on reading something else. Uh, 
it didn't really have any impact on them. Uh, when you read about something else, you other the other person. Uh, this idea of othering, yeah, making them different, making them somehow separate from you, as if it has no bearing on you at all that this other person dies. Uh, but of course it does, uh, right? This is the whole point. Uh, because the fact that someone else can die means that you actually are just like them. Uh, it is not as if you are somehow wiser, somehow you are doing all the right things, whereas they were doing all the stupid things. Uh, that is not really what it is like at all. Uh. The reality is that we are all in this together. Death can happen to anyone at any time. Uh. So when you read about death in the newspaper or wherever, uh, that could be you. Uh. That is the right attitude to have uh, to death. Uh. Yeah, you... Just like they walked into the street at the wrong time and a car came and mowed them down and they died. Just like someone. And it's sometimes really weird how people die. Yeah, they walk along a path and there are forest paths here, so watch out. And they stumble on a route and somehow they fall in the wrong way and they die. Yeah, these things happen. So uh, I'm not saying you shouldn't walk those paths. I'm saying when you walk those paths, yeah, death is closer than you think. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. <laughs> Death is always closer than we think. Yeah? We are never really ready to die. Yeah? But the only way to be ready to die is to be ready now. Now is the time to be ready, precisely because of the uncertainty of these things. Yeah? We don't know. Yeah? So when you read uh, those newspapers, uh, the right attitude to have uh, is to think of it, uh, that could be me. Yeah? And then you are on the right track. Yeah? And this is how we should uh, reflect on the idea of dying here. Yeah? And of course, it has very significant impacts on our life. Yeah? If death is so close to us, is ever-present, uh, the world is not, no longer really interesting. Yeah? And this is where this beautiful simile in the suttas uh, really comes to the fore. This is the simile of the borrowed goods. Uh, that everything in life is borrowed. Uh, we have things for a while, then we have to give it all up. Uh, and it's a powerful simile here. Uh, because uh, if you think of that, everything in this world pretty much is borrowed. Uh, there's very few things that you can take with you when you die, right? Everything, every, all the beautiful things in this world, all the things that you are attached to, everything you own in this world, uh, um, your uh, relation, all the people in this world, the people who are most dear to you, uh, everything has to go. Uh, your reputation, your sense of identity is often tied up with this world, your education, your class background, you know, England has one of the more class kind of conscious societies around, so class is important, and every society has, has status differences, yeah, uh, your, um, all of these things, your place in the family, all this identity business is tied up with this world, uh, that has to go when you die, yeah? your body has to go when you die, all of these things, uh, all of this is borrowed goods, uh, it all has to go. So how much do you want to invest in borrowed goods? If you rent a car, you rent an apartment, how much of your own money do you spend on a rented car or a rented apartment? Not very much, right? Because it's not for your benefit. In the same way, it is not for your benefit to invest in all of these things that belong to this world, because you're going to have to give it up very soon. So that doesn't mean you become callous, it doesn't become, you become cold-hearted, it doesn't mean you don't care about people, it doesn't mean you stop being kind, because that is the wrong way of thinking about this. But you care for a different reason. You don't care because you want to make relationships, you don't care because you want to amass a lot of goods or, or things in this world. You care because it is a spiritual quality. That is why you care, because you're building up your inner qualities. It is like that beautiful story. I told this story recently at uh, one of the talks I gave in London. And this is such a nice story that really draws out this point very beautifully. Uh, and this is some, it's an interaction I have with Ajahn Brahm. And, then, and uh, sometimes when you live with Ajahn, someone like Ajahn Brahm, you get to hear things that other people don't get to hear. So uh, because I heard that and then I kind of wrote it down and uh, I made it into a story later on and now it's been published in one of these books. Uh, but this is the story of uh, uh, Bodhinyana Monastery back in 1991. Uh, and there was a very big bushfire, and the bushfire was coming towards Bodhinyana Monastery. And it was the hottest day on record in Western Australia. And Western Australia gets pretty hot. It was 46 point something degrees. It's like when you try to breathe, it's like, oh, 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 
can't breathe, right? Because it's like it's painful to draw in the breath. Uh, so you, uh, so you, when you live in the forest and you kind of have to breathe that air, you it's kind of uh, not so nice. But anyway, so it's really super hot, and this is towards the end of January 1991. Uh, and at that time, the summer in Australia has already been going for two or three months. Yeah? December is summer, January is summer, November is kind of partial summer. Yeah? So it's absolutely tinder dry. Everything ignites like that. Yeah? And of course, in Australia, one of the main trees that we have down there are the eucalyptus trees, the gum trees. Yeah? And they are called gum trees for a reason, because they're full of oils and gum. Yeah, and so they are have a very inflammable once they get hot. So these trees, they explode, right? Because the oil and the gum in those leaves, uh, literally the heat just bang and the whole thing kind of explodes. And uh, apparently it is some amazing sight to see trees exploding like that. It's kind of pretty extraordinary. Yeah. And I think maybe that's why some people go and light the bushfires, right? Because most of these bushfires are lit by people now. They don't happen, some of them may happen naturally, but the majority apparently are lit by people. Maybe because they enjoy those exploding trees, I'm not sure. But it's kind of, this is kind of how things are. And so this fire is approaching the monastery. And then the fire brigade comes, and all the monks, they have evacuated into the main meditation hall at Bodhinana Monastery. And then the fire brigade comes, and they say, the monastery is finished, you have to evacuate. This enormous fire is coming, it's going to be the end of the monastery. And so Ajahn Brahm recognizes, well, we have to evacuate. And at that moment, uh, he knows that that's the end of the monastery here. Yeah? yeah, this monastery, Bodhinana Monastery, has been Ajahn Brahm's life's, it's been his life's work. He started building this monastery when they moved to that property in November 1983. Now it is January 1991, so what is it, seven years or whatever? Yeah, and he has spent almost all his time, almost all his waking hours, well not quite, he does some meditation of course as well, but he has spent so much time building this monastery here. Morning, afternoon, sometimes the flood lights out at night to continue to finish off whatever he's doing here. This is his life's work. Beautiful main hall, the kitchen area, the kutis in the forest. You should see, Ajahn Brahm is this incredible perfectionist. Everything is done to perfection. This was going to be a monastery that would last forever. And then the fire comes. Last forever, right? The delusion right there. And Ajahn Brahm recognized the delusion of this, right? You make something last forever, of course. So after that, instead of doing things 100%, he got the 70% rule, yeah, because he understood that is a much better way of doing things. Uh, so he went from being perfectionist to being really pretty mediocre, actually. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, I, don't, I hope you never see this talk. Yeah. <laughs> so, and at that point, he knew uh, the monastery was going to burn up. Uh, yeah, and so I asked as a man, well, how did you, what did that do? Uh, what, how did you feel about that? Uh, and he told me, well, at that moment, when I knew it was going to burn down, even though it was my life's work, even though I had spent thousands of hours building up that monastery, at that moment, I let go completely. Uh, I was completely at ease with the whole thing burning down. Uh, and I knew at that moment, uh, if the whole monastery burns down, uh, tomorrow morning, I will come back uh, and I will start from scratch. Uh, and I thought, wow. <laughs> I thought, how is that humanly possible? Huh? Most people would cry. Most people would lie on the ground and roll back and forth. Huh? <laughs> that is how they grieve in the suttas. It's really funny. They grieve by lying on the ground and rolling back and forth. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> Holding their tummies, maybe. Huh? And uh, so, uh, uh, that's kind of extraordinary, right? Let it go like that. And this is, this to me is like the real superpowers in life. This is the sign of incredibly profound wisdom, the ability to let go like that. And so the next question, of course, for me, from Ajahn Brahm to Ajahn Brahm was, well, how are you able to let go like that? How is that possible? And then this is where the answer comes. And this is kind of precisely what we're dealing with now. We're ties in with this idea of borrowed goods. And he said to me that the reason I built Bodhinana Monastery was not to create something. I didn't do this to, for the result of creating a monastery. Well, that was a secondary thing. That was kind of a, you know, a um, kind of consequence of what I was actually doing. What I really was doing was doing something good. 
I was doing an act of generosity here. I was doing an act of kindness. I was making something, a place where other people can practice the Dhamma and become ordained. That is why I was doing this. I was doing this as a spiritual practice. And that spiritual practice, whether the monastery burns down or not, can I continue the next day by coming back and rebuilding it? It's the same kind of spiritual practice. So in other words, he does it not for the result, but for the, uh, what he puts into it. It's not what he gets out of it, but how he does it that matters. And this is the kind of attitude that we all need in the world, right? Because the results in life are so uncertain. We don't know about the results. We don't know when we get together with somebody, we get married with somebody. We don't know how long that marriage is going to last. We may get divorced, someone may die. It is uncertain. So you do it not, it's not the what, it is the how you do it. So you use that relationship or whatever for in a spiritual way, right? You do, you live your life in a spiritual sense. All the things in your life that you try to acquire, the jobs that you want to do, the things you want to, the status you want to acquire in your life, uh, all of these things we are the kind of the trying to achieve things. Uh, that is secondary. Yeah. It doesn't really matter. It is how we achieve these things that matters. Uh, and you start, when you start to get that, uh, you start to put kindness into everything you do. Uh, you put compassion into everything you do. You put wisdom and peace. Uh, into everything you do, because that is the purpose of life. Everything else is just too uncertain. And so this is the kind of the um, lesson from that Ajahn Brahm story. This is the lesson from the idea of borrowed goods, because we only have them a short while, because we're always going to be uncertain about the outcomes in life. We cannot control the outcomes. There's only one outcome we can control. That is what we put into how we live our life. The input we can control. We can decide whether we're going to be angry or kind, whether we're going to be jealous or uh, compassionate, etc., etc. That we can control. But even that we can only control to some extent uh, because our minds too are conditioned uh, in, a, in a very large way. Uh. So the idea of death gives you the idea of borrowed goods because death you have to give up so much. Uh, and so you change your investment strategy. Uh, instead of investing uh, things in the world, instead of investing in things uh, that you know you're going to have to give up, uh, you invest in that which you will take with you into the future. Uh, and of course that is the mind. Uh, so invest in your mind. That is the really significant thing. Uh, how do you invest in your mind? Uh, by being kind, uh, by being caring, by being compassionate, by being understanding. Uh, don't identify with it too much. It's not about identifying. Uh, this is about just by doing these things. Uh, then you are on the right track. This is the idea of death, right? It changes your attitude. You don't have to change that much in your life. You don't have to become a monastic. Not straight away anyway. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe down the track, see what happens. That's not the point. The point is that your attitude to life changes, whether you are a lay person or even whether you are a monastic. Yeah. So, um, death, right? So again, very useful contemplation right there. Uh, if you understand it properly, it changes your entire outlook. It moves you onto the spiritual path. Uh, it makes it clear what really matters. Uh, then we have sorrow. Uh, yeah, you are uh, uh, liable to sorrow, understanding the drawbacks in sorrow. Uh, uh, seeks the uh, lack of sorrow, the freedom from sorrow, the supreme sanctuary and extinguishment. Uh, Again, sorrow is part of life. Yeah, grief is part of life. It is impossible to live a life without any kind of sorrow. And again, you can't really control it. We think that we can control these things, but we can't really control them. Guaranteed, if you're going to have some grief and sorrow and the tragedy is happening, you know, everyone has these things. And it's absolutely unavoidable. And so again, uh, it makes the whole idea of the ordinary five sense realm much less interesting because that is where the sorrow is found. Uh, it is not found in the higher realms of uh, meditation and all of this. Uh, so again, uh, you strive for the spiritual practice uh, and you become a little bit uh, disenchanted or uninterested in the five sense realm because that is where sorrow is usually found. Uh, then you have the idea of being corrupted. Yeah, I discussed that quite a bit uh, yesterday. 
Uh, corruption just means that we are all subject to defilements. Uh, and that is also very unpleasant, right? The fact that we don't know what's going to happen to us next. Uh, we don't know what's going to happen to the people or the animals around us. Uh, <coughs> they may become corrupted. Uh, and when things get corrupted, uh, they are no longer interesting. Just like money that gets corrupted uh, is not interesting because it loses its value in the same way. The people that we take to be valuable lose their value to us uh, once they get corrupted. Uh, but we are subject to corruption. Corruption can happen to anyone. Uh, they get more angry. Uh, they do all kinds of crazy things. They become immoral, whatever it is. Uh, this is the corruption of human beings. Uh, again, it dry, lose your interest in the five sense world. Uh, it moves you towards meditation and the spiritual path. And this is really the purpose of all of these things. Uh, and this is what made the Buddha to be go forth and become a monk. Yes, yeah? simple ideas, simple perceptions. Uh, and this is the beauty of the Buddhist path. Actually, it is very simple. Uh, you don't have to understand all the details of dependent origination. Uh, it is interesting, yeah? and if you are interested, great. But actually, it is not really necessary for this practice. What it comes down to are these simple things. This is really where these are the things that really have power for you because they're easy to understand, they're easy to apply. Yeah? And that is why they are so powerful. Yeah? I must admit, I still enjoy things like dependent origination and all the intricacies of the Dhamma, and to me that gives added confidence in these teachings. Uh, so actually I think it is useful, uh, but uh, it is not useful for studying in its own, just for its own sense or its own, you know, reason. Uh, uh, you study it because it gives rise to confidence and it gives rise to something larger. It, you study dependent origination so that we can contemplate old age. Yeah, that's kind of the reason. Uh, that's how I see it. Uh, because when you understand the big picture, uh, the smaller bits and pieces start to make sense in the context of the big picture. Uh, so when you see what's going on, okay, then contemplation of old age is easier, then being kind is easier, then all of these things uh, kind of come out of that. Uh, so that's really the right way of thinking about this. Uh. So let's uh, carry on a little bit. Uh. Um, so this is then called the noble search, right? You seek the freedom from these things. You're looking for something higher. You know? And then uh, the Buddha carries on and he says as follows. He says, mendicants, uh, before my awakening, uh, when I was still unawakened but intent on awakening, uh, I too, being liable to be reborn, sought what is also liable to be reborn. Uh, Myself liable to grow old, to fall sick, to die, to sorrow, and become corrupted, I sought what is also liable to these things. So here the Buddha is making it quite clear. Yeah, this is before his awakening. He was still the Buddha to be. Um, and he he is again like us. Yeah, he is intent on these things, seeking these things. We saw before that the idea of seeking these things really means that you are attached to them. Yeah, it said before you are attached to them, you are tied to them, you are infatuated with them. That's kind of what seeking these things mean. So this is, again, this sense that the Buddha to be is very similar to us. Yeah, same kind of attachments, same kind of problems, but also very powerful spiritual faculties. Yeah, it kind of it makes it easier to relate to the Buddha when you see that he was dealing with exactly the same things that we are dealing with. Uh, and um, what is also a little bit interesting, I just mentioned this in passing, yeah, uh, he talks about when I was still unawakened but intent on awakening. Yeah, and that is this word, intent on awakening. Yeah, because that word is actually bodhisattva. Yeah, or bodhisattva is actually the word. Yeah. And uh, traditionally that is left untranslated because people reckon that bodhisattva is self-explanatory, uh, but it is, not, it is anything but self-explanatory, right? It's actually very hard to really understand what that word means, it turns out. Uh, and uh, the, the fact that we then later on in Buddhism get this very developed uh, bodhisattva uh, kind of path, yeah? and this developed bodhisattva um, doctrine, if you like, uh, that doesn't mean that that actually is what it means in the suttas. It's very easy because we already have an idea of bodhisattva 
which we have received from the contemplative culture around us. And then when you read the suttas, you read all those ideas into the suttas. It's natural for us to do that, right? Because we think that these words have the same meaning. But of course they don't have the same meaning. Because the idea of the Bodhisattva was developed over centuries after the Buddha passed away. They were developed, why? Well, because people ask questions such as, well, who actually was the Buddha? Right? Where did he come from? What is his full story? And these things became very important when the Buddha died because they were missing the Buddha. Yeah, you can imagine having the Buddha around, asking him for all sorts of things. Everything is kind of decided by the Buddha. And then he's gone. He's this towering spiritual figure who is very inspiring, has full of loving kindness and looks after you and gives answer to all the questions. And then he is gone. That is traumatic. Yeah, big time traumatic. And uh, for that reason, uh, people then start asking questions. Well, actually, who was it? We need to write down the 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 the, um, the the feeling of missing someone makes you kind of want to rebuild their life story so as to understand who they were to make sense out of it. Uh, and so this is where this, I think, uh, and other people are saying the same thing, of course, uh, where this uh, search for the full story of the Buddha comes about. Uh, And then the whole Bodhisattva doctrine, an ideal, emerges from that kind of search. And, uh, but of course, that does not mean that when this word in the suttas is used in the suttas, it means that at all. In the suttas, on the contrary, it seems to mean just the time after the Buddha goes forth from the home life until his awakening. That is the time when he is a Bodhisattva. There is a couple of exceptions to that in the suttas. Uh, for example, in the Acharya Buddha Sutta, Majjhima 123, the wonderful and marvelous, it is used a little bit more broadly, but uh, generally speaking, that is how it's used in the suttas. That kind of makes sense, right? Uh, awakening being, bodhisattva, from the moment you go forth, you decide you want to awaken uh, until you uh, die, uh, uh, until you become awakened. <laughs> and uh, so this is uh, uh, this kind of... So when you start to read it in the suttas, uh, you actually see it is used differently. Uh. So what does actually this word mean, the word bodhisattva? Uh? Well, usually it is kind of translated or understood as awakening being. Yeah? Sattva is being, uh, bodhi is awakening. Uh. But awakening being is a kind of strange compound. Uh. Being for awakening, being, exactly how does that work? Uh? It's kind of a little bit weird, yeah, and it does not, it's not necessarily all that uh, compelling, the, that kind of translation. Uh. And so one of the kind of famous uh, scholars of uh, Sanskrit, uh, a fellow called Richard Gombrich, who was a professor of Sanskrit at Oxford University for over 30 years, uh, he said that actually probably this word, it means something else. Uh, it probably means bodhisattva rather than bodhisattva. Uh, and bodhisattva means intent on awakening. Uh. And kind of all the pieces fall into place once you see that. Uh, That is probably the original meaning of this word. Uh, It relates to a different Sanskrit word. Uh, And of course, the person who is intent on awakening uh, is precisely that person who goes forward from the home life uh, and then he is intent until he achieves the awakening. Uh, That period is the Bodhisattva period. And that is how it is generally used in the suttas. Uh, Someone who is trying, someone who is intending uh, to overcome the defilements, to overcome suffering, uh, and to attain this insight uh, into the nature of reality and overcome all of these problems. Uh, That's kind of interesting. uh, And it shows us how easy it is uh, when you read the suttas uh, to read later ideas uh, into the early suttas. uh, in fact, it is almost impossible not to do so. It is, it is impossible, uh, because we are all influenced by the society around us. We're influenced by books we have read, uh, and there's no way you're going to be able to read everything uh, neutrally. There's, nothing can ever be read neutrally. Uh, but uh, when you are aware of that, uh, that it is impossible to read things neutrally, it means you become a little bit more uh, circumspect when you read the suttas. Uh, you look for maybe alternative explanations. Uh, And this is one example of that. So when the Buddha was still unawakened, he realized that he had these problems, just like we have these problems. But then he takes a different course from most people. And this is what makes the Buddha so interesting here. Yeah, being liable to all things. Then the next thing is, then it occurred to me. 
Why do I, being liable to be reborn, grow old, fall sick, sorrow, die and become corrupted, seek things that have the same nature? It's a very good question. If there is a problem, why seek all of these things that actually have exactly the same problem? Compounding the problem in your own life. Why don't I seek the freedom from birth, the unborn, the unaging, the freedom from old age, the unailing, the freedom from illness, the undying, the freedom from death, the sorrowless, the freedom from sorrow, the uncorrupted, the freedom from corruption, the supreme sanctuary extinguishment. Yeah, and this is what kind of makes the Buddha special. He sees a problem and then he decides to do something about it. And this is where the Buddha is different from almost anyone else in the world. This kind of audacity, this willingness to do the impossible. Yeah, nobody does this kind of thing. They don't, very few people walk off into the forest and say, I'm going to find the solution to death. Yeah, no one does that because it just sounds way over the top. What do you mean you're going to walk in the forest and find a solution to death? You, you're crazy. You can hang out with us here and have fun and let's go to the pub together. That's kind of, that's kind of the usual way that people <laughs> deal with life. But the, this is what makes the Buddha so special. And in our society, it is almost unthinkable, right? It's almost impossible that in kind of here in the, in the UK or in anywhere in Europe for that matter or most places of the world, it is almost unthinkable to do this sort of thing because it's so far away from how we think about the world. And this is why I think that the reason why this was possible for the Buddha is because they already had a very kind of powerful religious or spiritual society in India. People who were ascetics, people who went forth into the, into the homelessness, who actually did go into the forest and build little huts for themselves. This, this was an accepted part of ancient Indian society. Even today, it is to some extent part of Indian society. So that society was geared towards these things. It was geared towards you get supported if you were an ascetic in this way. People were already practicing samadhi. They had gone a long way on this path. And so it was a little bit easier in that society to become a monastic and to think this kind of almost unthinkable that was possible there. And uh, this is why I think that uh, uh, Jambudipa, India, Jambudipa is the Pali word for India, uh, this is why Buddhas always uh, arise in the India or Jambudipa, because India is just a name for that kind of society which has those qualities that make it possible for a Buddha to arise. Anyway, that's my theory. I'm not sure if it's a good theory, but it is a theory. Yeah. So, um, uh, this is what the Buddha does. This is what makes the Buddha special. Yeah? This kind of being very, being very kind of confident, yeah? and understanding that there is a big problem. There's nothing really worthwhile doing in the world unless I can solve this problem. Uh, and is willing to put his entire life on the line uh, to see if there is a solution to this. Because life is not worth living anyway if there isn't a solution to this. Uh, that's kind of the insight, the motivation, the, the driving force, what impels the Buddha at this particular point. Uh, the Buddha to be, I should say, he's still only the Buddha to be. Uh. Sometime later, while still black-haired, blessed with youth in the prime of life, uh, though my mother and father wished otherwise, weeping with tearful faces, uh, I shaved off my hair and beard and dressed in oak robes, uh, and went forth from the lay life to homelessness. Yeah, so uh, he was still young. This is, of course, is an important part of this. Uh, you, the younger you are when you enter the monastic life, the better. Uh, yeah, because you have more energy, you are more ready to, you are more flexible, you are not so stuck in your ways, and all these kind of things. Uh, so the younger you are in the prime of life is the time to go forth. Uh, so um, it's... Um, you know, it should be so, uh, it's kind of fascinating. I, you know, you travel around the world and you send most people in the world, they are not very happy here. If their children, for example, say, oh, I want to become a monk. Yeah. And they say, but you are so bright. Yeah, you, you can become a lawyer or a doctor or whatever. It, you should, you know, you should kind of use that brightness in a good one, not become a monk or a nun. You know, what, what are you thinking here? 
this kind of standard way of thinking around the world. In the West, of course, not so common because very few people say they want to become a monk. But if you go to Sri Lanka or you go to Malaysia or Singapore or these places, yeah, the last thing they want is for their sons and daughters to become monks and nuns. If you are a real dumb dumb huh, and you can't really do anything in life, okay, then you can become a monk or a nun. You know? <laughs> they will look after you. Huh? That's kind of the idea. This is how it works in those countries. But actually, it's the other way around, right? If you are really young and you are smart and you can learn, you can kind of do all the good things, you can become a good teacher perhaps, you have the ability to articulate these teachings in a good way, that is when you should become a monk, right? That is the kind of people we need in Buddhism. These are the people who will help us and bring the Dhamma forward into the new societies, into the new age, have the ability to think about things in a new way and to deal with the kind of new challenging situations in the world and see those in light of the Dhamma and these kind of things. So uh, I always say to those people, and, and it's actually very nice to see this happening, when you teach people the Dhamma and they start to understand, they start to say, wow, if I have a son and daughter in her, I'm going to tell them, even if they don't want to, I'm going to tell them, become a monk or nun. <laughs> That's going too far, right? They should actually want to become a monk or nun. But uh, at least we give them a bit of encouragement, right? Okay, monk and nuns, cool, yeah? So come with me and check out Ajahn, Ajahn Brahm when he comes to kind of Singapore or wherever he goes, UK. Yeah, he's coming to the UK actually in November. So you can kind of meet Ajahn Brahm then. Huh? And uh, that is the right way of thinking about this, yeah? So we want... People who have good hearts, yeah, who are young, yeah, who are intelligent. Intelligence is not so important, yeah, because it's, this is spiritual practice, a bit different from intelligence. But intelligence can be helpful sometimes. Yeah. Go forth, yeah, becoming a doctor, who cares? Yeah, it's kind of irrelevant. You can help a few people as a doctor, good. You can help far more people if you become a really good monastic camp. So um, he goes forth. Uh, and then he has this idea that though my mother and father wished otherwise, weeping with tearful faces, yeah? This is an interesting little point here. It's a little bit on the side of what we're talking about, but uh, it is uh, interesting because uh, traditional story of the Buddha is that uh, he left his wife and his son in the middle of the night, yeah? He, they were kind of sleeping, uh, and he gets on the horse Kantaka, and he kind of rides out of the city into the sunset. Actually, it's in the middle of the night, it's not sunset, but anyway, <laughs> kind of making it a bit more poetic. Yeah. It, it all sounds very poetic, right, when you read this. Uh, and he jumps over the walls of the city. It's this magnificent city with millions of people. Actually, Kaplavatu was like, more like a small village. That's the reality of it. Uh, <laughs> if you go to some of these archaeological sites in India, you'll be surprised how small everything seems, right? Uh, this was a time before really big cities in India. Everything was very low-key. Yeah? And so you start to see that actually, no, he didn't leave in the middle of the night. Uh, it wasn't just an irresponsible person who left his wife and child, child behind. Uh, this is often used by people outside of Buddhism, and maybe rightly so. They say, oh, look at your Buddha, yeah, he's bad, yeah, irresponsible, leave his wife and child behind. And of course, for most Buddhists, we forgive that, because he was on a bigger mission. Yeah? So we kind of forgive it. But still, it does seem a little bit irresponsible now. This is the reality. Yeah? He had spoken to his parents. Uh, he had told them that he was about to go forth. They didn't want it. They were crying. Yeah, they were kind of, ah, oh, no, please don't go forth. You can imagine how beloved someone like the Buddha would have been to his parents. He was obviously an extraordinarily special person in so many ways. No parents want that kind of person to go forth. And then he decides that uh, he wants to go forth. He speaks to his parents. Yeah, they know what's going on. And obviously, he has made uh, what is required for his, parent, for his wife and child to be looked after. These were large families. They lived together. Yeah. So they would have been okay here. So he was, after all, responsible there. And that later legend is all it is, it's just a legend. But unfortunately, that legend is what everyone knows about. They don't know about what's in the suttas. Yeah, and that's kind of the problem. This is a problem with the Buddhist education around the world. You get to hear all the later stuff, not the early stuff. You get kind of a cultural Buddhism, not the Buddhism of the Buddha. And that is uh, part of the problem here. Uh. So little things like that are kind of interesting here. Yeah. I was told that in Sri Lanka, the Christian missionaries, uh, and uh, there are Christian missionaries, uh, some of the 
uh, some certain countries are really keen on sending missionaries out there. And uh, they, one of the ways of converting the Buddhists, the other Buddhists in the villages, is precisely with these kind of stories. Uh, the Buddha wasn't responsible. Yeah, he left his wife and child uh, become a Christian, much better. Yeah. And so they think, oh, yeah, maybe you're right. Yeah, maybe I've got this all wrong. You're right. It says in the books the Buddha was irresponsible. Okay, I've become a Christian. Yeah. And sometimes it, uh, you know, this is uh, the kind of conversion techniques that are used. Uh, and uh, it's uh, very kind of... Uh, I don't know, unscrupulous and, and dodgy, but still, because in Christianity the idea of conversion is so important, uh, they actually would use these kind of techniques. Uh, in Buddhism, it's also nice to, for people to become Buddhist, because, you know, we have this amazing spiritual path, uh, but it's not about conversion for conversion's sake, as it is in Christianity. In Buddhism, it's more like, okay, you become a Buddhist because you want to practice this path. Uh, it's not about being a Buddhist as such. Uh, so it's only if I can persuade you that this is really worthwhile, that is when you should become a Buddhist. So we have a very different idea about how we spread the teachings compared to, for example, Christianity, where the idea of conversion is so incredibly important, otherwise you go to hell, right? You can kind of see it from the point of view of Christians. If you go to hell, and if I don't convert you, okay, you know, you, you become quite, it becomes quite important in those, uh, at that if that is true. Uh, anyway, the fact that that doesn't make any sense is a completely different uh, matter. Uh, um, so he shaves off his hair and beard. Uh, yeah, He becomes a monk. Uh, he dresses in the ochre robe. This is kind of ochreish, I suppose. Uh, uh, ochre is a very broad range of colors, and you will see that uh, some robes look more green, some look more yellow, some look more red, and some are more kind of brownish like this one. Uh, and he goes forth uh, from the lay life to homelessness. Uh, yeah, the Buddha was a monk. He dressed like a monk. He was largely indistinguishable from other monks. Uh, and this is also what you see here. And he goes forth. Uh, so this is what made the Buddha go forth. Simple things, uh, simple reflections on the nature of existence. Uh, and these are the things that we too can reflect in exactly the same way, precisely because it is fairly straightforward, because it is quite a simple thing to do. So that is the beginning here. This is the first part I want to talk about, about the idea of right view. And remember, when we talk about these ideas of right view, we have to cultivate these ideas. They don't sink in straight away. You have to reflect on these things again and again and again. And as you do so, gradually, that uh, a super tanker of habits from the past start to turn in a different direction. Uh, the momentum from the past is incredibly strong. Uh, and because it is so strong, you have to keep on reconditioning your mind to see things in a different way. Uh, and it's kind of sensible, right? When you hear this, it's very hard to kind of argue with this. Uh, it really is super duper sensible. Uh, and you start to understand that the majority of people in the world actually are deluded about life. Uh, but if you are so lucky to have come into the contact with the teachings of the Buddha, you actually have an opportunity to change that. So this afternoon we're going to carry on with this. We're going to look at other aspects of right view. And we're going to have a bit of fun with right view because it is so fundamental and so foundational for the whole path. And because I think it is often neglected, I think it is very useful to carry on with that. In the meantime, Please have a very nice lunch. There's going to be some more interviews coming up soon. So I hope to see you over there for those of you who are on the list. And then Ayatollah uh, Wulpeka uh, uh, is going to do a guided meditation at 2.30. Yeah, so that's going to happen then. So uh, uh, we so keep on having a good time here.